I'm science educator and the least attractive Hemsworth brother, Kyle Hill. As legendary physicist Richard Feynman once said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. That's why before today's episode, I watched the documentary Exploring Quantum History with Brian Greene on CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's episode. CuriosityStream is the award-winning destination for documentary series and features covering every topic from space exploration to dinosaurs. CuriosityStream adds new films and series each week with subscriptions starting at just $2.99 a month plus 25% off for a year subscription plus you can watch it just about anywhere screens exist. If you want to try CuriosityStream like I did, you can go down into the description box below, click the link, and get CuriosityStream for a full year for just $15. Personally, I'm going to be going on it to watch David Attenborough's Light on Earth later tonight, because as you know, if there's two things that I love, it's bioluminescence and old British dudes. Now, let's see just how much quantum mechanics we can understand today. To me, this might be one of the coolest and most easily amazing effects in all of science, but its explanation is also one of the most casually confusing. So today, what is quantum levitation? And how does it work? You're staring again. Oh, right, sorry. I just, I may have developed a perpetual motion device. Now entering the facility. As with anything to do with quantum mechanics, to really get our heads around this topic, we need to begin with the basics. Yes, I could just hold up a wafer of yttrium barium copper oxide and yell quantum like I'm Deepak Chopra or something, but then we wouldn't really learn anything and we'd just be selling poorly written self-help books. So let's begin with magnets. How do they work? Whoop, whoop. Well, don't worry, Juggalettes. Your boy got you. So a strong permanent magnet like the neodymium squares you are seeing on screen project a magnetic field outside of themselves as the result of innumerable atomic alignments. If we zoom all the way down to the size of atoms, we will see the secret of magnetism that has confounded many a juggalo. In this simplified diagram, simplified remember, of a single atom, we have a nucleus of protons and neutrons with a quote unquote orbiting electron. The electron is zipping around the nucleus, spinning like a tiny moon as it orbits. This spin and the motion of the nucleus gives the atom an overall magnetic moment. Keep in mind, nothing is really spinning, it's more of a quantum mechanic, never mind. Now, in most materials, the magnetic moments of the atoms are all over the place, and any overall magnetic field that would be generated is instead canceled out by the randomness. But in a permanent magnet like neodymium, all of the atoms' moments instead add up. They are aligned. The microscopic influence from quadrillions of tiny magnetic fields adds up and an overall magnetic field pushes itself outside of the boundaries of the material. So far so good? Great, feel free to show that last part of the video to any juggalos that you might know who wear way too big shorts with chains. The next step is to understand what happens when a magnetic field starts moving. As we said, electrons orbiting their nuclei have some influence on the atom's magnetic moment. It stands to reason then that a strong external magnetic field might attract or repel those tiny magnetic moments. In short, moving magnets moves electrons. And this is the real key to quantum levitation. Staring. Yep, yep. sorry, it's just, it's really cool. There is another name for moving electrons, for moving charged particles, and that is electric current. Now, one of the fundamental properties of electromagnetism is that an electric current generates its own magnetic field. So if you're following along, we have a moving magnet creating or inducing an electric current which creates its own magnetic field. The reason why this happens has to do with special relativity and the fact that an electric field or a magnetic field can be the same thing as viewed from different points of reference, but that has to do with Einstein and frame-dependent length contraction. And if you want to know more about all of that, you can just go to my adoptive father Veritasium's YouTube channel and check it all out there. What we want to know is that the magnetic field from this electric current is not random. In fact, it's created in opposition to the original magnetic field that made all of this happen. It's because of electromagnetism that these fields are always intertwined in this way, like uh, peanut butter and jelly, macaroni and cheese, or millennials and depression. You know what I mean. You're probably anxious right now, aren't you? Aren't you? So to recap, a changing magnetic field or magnetic flux can induce an electric current or 
eddy current in some conductive material, which then in turn creates its own magnetic field in opposition to its parent, like a teen with very poorly cut bangs. Now, once you understand eddy currents that can attract and repel like normal magnets do, you can see some absolutely amazing physics, like the slowing of a strong magnet falling down in a copper tube, or the magnetic breaking that looks almost like magic when you put a hunk of aluminum in an MRI. Don't do that. But even with a magnetic field strength of an MRI that is 50,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, nothing is levitating yet. Why? Well, that question brings us to the last piece of this puzzle. Did you ever do this little science experiment as a kid? I did. You take a strong permanent magnet and you run it along something that your teacher told you could become magnetic. Ooh, that's amazing, Mr. D. But now we can explain what's actually happening here. When you have something like a material like inside of this nail that has a lot of misaligned magnetic moments, you can take a strong permanent magnet like these neodymium disks and you can run it across the nail 20 to 30 times and what it does, it causes all those magnetic moments to line up with the magnetic field specifically of this magnet. And so do it enough times and you can make the magnetic field of this look like this and have some fleeting magnetism. We can explain this effect now. And you could call it the juggalo down if you want, <laughs> which I do want to do. When I was just a boy, before I invented the patented lion's mane, I got to ride a real hoverboard. Sure, it sounded like a dying cat when you turned it on and only had a battery life of a few minutes, but it did indeed hover. Now, the inventor of this hoverboard didn't want to tell me how it actually worked, you know, it was patented at all, but when I guess spinning magnets driven by a motor, he got all shifty, so I guess I'm probably right, and you now have the tools to explain why I was right. Spinning magnets in the bottom of this board would create some changing magnetic fields, some magnetic flux, and this would induce an electric current in the copper beneath the board or another conductive material, which would create eddy currents which would serve to repel the board and lift it up. We are definitely closer now to quantum levitation, but again, there's a problem. Copper is very conductive, but there's still some electrical resistance to electric current in something like copper. To achieve truly effortless quantum levitation, we would need stable and non-dissipating eddy currents and zero resistance to electric flow. So now we need to go beyond the conductor to the superconductor. And this thing I've had in my pocket this whole time just so happens to be one. He named <laughs> it Stephanie. I, what? I don't fall in love with exotic materials. What? What? Certain materials under certain conditions allow electrons inside of those materials to flow completely free of any electrical resistance and therefore form inside them perfectly stable ed ed and eddy currents. These materials are called superconductors. Stephanie here is just such a superconductor which I specced out and purchased with the help of quantumlevitation.com and the quantum condition she needs to be in is one of cryogenic temperatures. We can get these temperatures via immersion in another material, liquid nitrogen, which you can purchase easily enough just about anywhere. Now, why a superconductor exactly transitions into superconducting at sufficiently low temperatures is extremely complicated. It will have to suffice for me to say today that if you want to know more about it, you can look up so-called BCS theory, which won a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1972. What's important for us to understand to continue this program is that we know enough of the physics to make relatively easy and very nicely high temperature superconducting material. So now it's time to go all the way back to the beginning of this program. Watch this. Now, if I did my job right, you should be able to explain why this happens. Above the superconductor, gravity is trying to pull the magnet down. But if the magnet did fall, that would be changing the magnetic field, right? So in response to the falling magnet and the changing fields, eddy currents form and stabilize in the superconductor below. At every possible instant, we are witnessing a magnet falling but met by perfect eddies in opposition, flowing freely and perfectly in a superconductor. Also note that I can spin the magnet about this axis because it doesn't change the magnetic field. This phenomenon also works in reverse, and I gotta be honest, I've 
kind of been holding out on you. The reverse situation, which happens for different reasons, might be even cooler than this. Yeah, I know. Wow, this is absolutely amazing, right? And you probably noticed something different. It's not spinning, it's not moving around, and if I touch it, it almost stays in the orientation I leave it in three-dimensional space-time, like it's magically locked in space. This is due to a related phenomenon that we just need a little bit more physics to fully explain. What's that? Oh, uh, no, Ari and I just worked together. Saturday? Uh, yeah, I'm... Yeah, I should be. It's not, it, what? It's not weird. Just a quick aside about magnet safety before we continue. Magnets are awesome. They're quantum magic that we can see with our own peepers, but they are no joke. Very strong magnets like these neodymium discs, which you can buy basically anywhere, are deceptive in that they react with each other dependent on the distance. The attractive force between them gets exponentially larger the closer they get according to the square of the distance. That is to say, they don't seem like they're an issue until they're totally an issue. And with bigger magnets, this, if you're not paying attention, could lead to pinched skin, injury, broken fingers, all that kind of stuff. So for the rest of the episode, know that my magnets are being stored in special packaging, they're away from other metal surfaces that they could be attracted to, and they're away from my sensitive electronics. Look, magnets are awesome, but they are no joke, and you gotta take them really seriously, okay? What? Are you using neodymium magnets as earrings? No. Stop snitching on me today, dang. The ultimate in quantum levitation is this, a superconductor amazingly locked in space-time. It occurs because one of the other fundamental characteristics of these materials is that when they fall below the superconducting transition temperature, they expel all of the magnetic fields within them. When a superconductor is placed in a magnetic field, the material will force any flux, any changing magnetic field, to go around. Specific superconductors though, type two superconductors like the one you see here, will let some field through. Now we have magnetic vortices acting like invisible pins, holding the superconductor in space, unlike the levitating magnet. If you want to put everything in more physics-y terms, our type two superconductor made of yttrium barium copper oxide, when it falls below the transition temperature, displays the Meissner effect due to the impurities in the material and therefore gets flux pinned in space. Those $10 words are nice and all, but they don't mean very much unless you understand the key concepts behind them and hopefully now you do. And hey, let's, let's stare at it some more. This is probably the coolest thing that I've ever seen with my own seeing balls. And better yet, we now know exactly how this works and why this happens. If you want to see just how crazy quantum levitation can get, stay tuned on this channel in the upcoming weeks because I worked with quantumlevitation.com to make what I think is a world first. It's, it's gonna be awesome. Until next time. Oh, he cooled down. It's all right, you can rest. It cools down and then the effect goes away. I didn't explain that part. Now exiting the facility. 
Thank you so much to the Very Nerdy Facility staff for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Jun Choi and visiting scholar Michael Calder. If you want to join the facility, get on the staff, get your lab coat, get episodes early, get behind the scenes photos and videos, get to join the Discord, talk with me almost every day, join our D&D groups, our Magic the Gathering League, all that nerdy goodness, you can go to patreon.com slash kylehill and get on the staff today. And hey, if you support the facility just enough, get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds of you. I'm adding minutes to the ends of these videos and that really hurts watch time and I have no idea. Do you know what's fun about liquid nitrogen? It's not really fun, but it's interesting. So a doer of liquid nitrogen like this, this is what is really expensive about liquid nitrogen. And as you can see, the cap is very loose. That's because there is no doer that has a solid cap. Do you know why? Well, there's basically no place in the universe where it's going to be a advantageous environment for the temperature here. That is to say that it's always going to evaporate. And if that's the case, then if this was sealed, which it never is, then eventually it'd build up enough pressure to explode. So these are never fully capped. There's even a pressure release valve Re release valve here, it's heavy, release valve here that is just, just with a little bit of goo on there so it could also, it could all. Thanks for watching.